very unhealthy. You should sit down for two days. So, uh, so it's very responsible of us to, uh, to have a little room so we can get a little exercise. Uh, my name is Lars Kluwer. I'm the director of the Danish Board of Technology, which is a technology assessment institution in, in Denmark. I've uh, been working uh, very much with the methodology and technology assessment, the engagement, and also, uh, lastly, I was coordinator of the PACITA project, which was about institutionalizing technology assessment across Europe. Uh, and Liu, sitting uh, here, uh, was leading the part of uh, that project, which where that, that was in the focus. Uh, why am I saying this? Because this session is, is called the craftsmanship. But it's about, it's, it's about that, but it's about how we actually ensure that there is craftsmanship across Europe to be able to do responsible research and innovation and to forward it. So you can call it an institutionalization discussion or a mainstreaming discussion. Um, and and uh, well, what is inside such a, such a discussion? For example, as it was said in the, uh, in the beginning of this conference, our eyes not New. It might be new as a concept, but in the future we have, we have developed institutions uh, in ethics, in technology assessment, in foresight, in uh, CSR, in many areas. We have rule sets uh, of different kinds, and RI in a way stands on the shoulders of that. The interesting question is then, will RRI be so heavy that standing on the shoulders of that will push it down? Or will RRI, by standing on the shoulders, lift it up? That's interesting. And uh, you could say, in a way, that there is, in mainstreaming, always a paradox. We want to spread it out all over the place. But by spreading it out all over the place, we run the risk that the competences get lower, <coughs> and the implementation gets better. Not better, but badder. And, uh, and, 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 and therefore, we, we have this, this uh, mainstreaming thing has, the, has opposite directions in it. We want to go <coughs> out, but we also want to make it better. So do we need front runners in order to make good mainstreaming for the many who will do it in the future? So all these kind of paradoxes are there <coughs> in mainstreaming. Uh, and we want to talk about that. Uh, in the opening of the conference, um, I noted here Robert uh, Gianni, who said, we have to develop institutional basis for ensuring uh, uh, responsible reflection on the frame that facilitates the reflexivity. So the, the whole thing is that if we, if we don't have this institutional basis, then who will actually forward ROI as a practice? So, we have four presenters. We have uh, Ari Rip, uh, probably known by many of you. Ari has a big legacy in constructive technology assessments, which, in my view, embeds many of the things we talked about. We have Leo Hennen from uh, ETAS, the Technology Assessment Institute in, uh, in the Karlsruhe Technology of the uh, uh, Institute of Technology. And Leo has also been in CAB, the Technology Assessment advisory uh, office for the German Bundestag. Uh, then we have uh, David Vinikov from the OECD. And David, I think you're, uh, you're, you're the secretary of a working party on bio, nano, and converting technologies in the science and tech policy division at OECD. And what that means in practice, you have to tell us. Then we have Monica, Monica Schofield, and uh, in your program it says Hilary Sutcliffe. Hil Hilary could not, was not able to arrive here, so Monica bravely stepped in instead of Hilary. And Hilary will, uh, Monica will <laughs> present the industrial development of this, uh, seen from a task force in Yama, and, uh, and the discussions that's been there about responsible <coughs> innovation in, in industry. Uh, you have, we have said six to eight minutes each, that's not much. But just to give you an idea why we have to stick to it, uh, I made a little calculation. If you stick to it, then we have half an hour in the end <laughs> for a broader discussion. And I don't think we want that to be shortened. 
So we need to fix it. Uh, and I think we will just follow the, the, the line of speakers we have here and start with Ari. Thank so you. the floor is yours, Ari. So thank you. Um, I'll add to, a little bit to the introduction that you gave uh, us, because also in relation to a point I want to make later, I started out in this overall field uh, as a young chemist, not a philosopher or a sociologist. Um, and that was in the 1970s, a long time ago. And that was, that was the time of the, the critical student movement, but also critical young staff in universities, which pushed for a number of things, including science and society teaching in the physics, uh, biology, chemistry, uh, departments, and I was part of that, um, and there is a sort of interesting return of the things that were proposed then in the 2000s, not just for our eye, if you, I've been to science and governance meetings in Brussels a number of times, and there you could see that uh, a number of things were proposed that were also proposed by the critical movement in the 70s. Um, I also, first, in, in my part of that was that I tried to write up the whole notion of responsibility of chemists in a PhD thesis, which was never published, but it's a pity now. But, uh, <laughs> but I do draw on it sometimes when there are discussions about responsibility, because um, one of my points there was that responsibility and the discussion of responsibility is actually a sort of language which allows us to um, talk about roles and responsibilities again and how these are divided. I'll come back to that again in, my, in the last minute or so. Um, basically, the question about the craft in the sense of institutions, I think has to be separated by distinguishing three streams and the wider world. Three streams is uh, first uh, in terms of cloud uh, for the time being. Uh, you could call it Brussels, the European Commission, and uh, units in the DG Research and Innovation, but also some people who are interested in that in other uh, dir directorates general. Um, there is a lot of bureaucratic politics there, you can see how um, DG Research and Innovation has defined RRI in terms of the five keys. There was a slide actually where there were eggs in a nest and each of these eggs was a key. Um, and that's more a matter of bureaucratic survival that it actually addresses responsible research and innovation. Um, also, there is lots of politics in Brussels, of course, and there will be occasion, I think, tomorrow talk about that as well. I don't remember exactly the only problem, but, but the Jung, Juncker agenda is discussed. So that stream actually uh, might uh, stop at one moment. You never know. Uh, it's there in Horizon 2020. It may not be there in the next framework program. Uh, the second stream, which is very visible in this conference, is that of academics and uh, often being funded through Brussels, but not only through that. Um, and that, to some extent, is a sort of self-referencing circuit uh, discussing RRI, and it's somewhat inward-looking. But then there's a third stream of organizations, like research funding organizations, some bigger research programs, occasionally universities, which are under credibility pressures. They feel they need a social license to operate in this world. And that's why they make moves. And there are sort of obvious examples like the UK um, Engineering and Physical Research Council, the Physical Science Research Council, to some extent the Norwegians and the Dutch. Um, and because social license to operate it will not disappear, their work will not disappear. It might be have different labels. So these are three streams, but then there's also the wider world, including large parts of industry, where they do feel the social license to operate, but 
don't really know why they should buy, buy into RRI. Also because RRI is a bit shapeless. And I'm not too worried about that because RRI is a social innovation, you could say. And social innovations are open-ended and difficult to, uh, to see what they are at an early stage. So the important thing there is to look how it will develop. Not just because it's necessary, but because it's interesting to see what comes of it in this complex world. Um, then the other part, the uh, other two parts of my remarks is first that um, this whole notion of becoming concrete obviously is important, but it will also <coughs> introduce path dependencies, and so we have to be sure that um, the, the, the path dependencies that you get into are okay, are acceptable, are not confining you too much. But then the other thing is that RRI, as I intimated already, must be part of larger changes, because in the 1970s, elements of RRI were there, but they were sort of peripheral, they were uh, pushed as something to change the world of science and of innovation. Now, they could be uh, a regular part, they are discussed in that way, and so you could think of overall changes in that period of 40 years. Uh, something like recontextualization of science in society, a phrase that's been used, I think, is a good phrase. There's also this notion of reflexive modernization in the risk society, again, as a change between the 1970s and now. Uh, in my own work, actually together with uh, Claire Shelley Egan, who's over there, uh, we have um, tried to uh, see this as openings in the existing divisions of moral labor between the various actors in society. Um, so that has to be kept in mind because becoming concrete, you know, let, let's say one remark first. This morning in the opening, there was sort of the idea of a political momentum for RRI. If you follow my analysis, there is not so much as a political <coughs> momentum. Um, it might be in certain specific situations and with sort of these specific organizations, but in Brussels it's, it's quite quest it's questionable that it was actually political momentum. Uh, so becoming concrete is important in order to be visible, be recognizable and so on. But um, that should not uh, be at the expense of the larger issues and dynamics. What sort of world are we living in now which is different from the 1970s, which allows us to actually have this discourse of responsible research innovation, or under whatever name it will be called. Thank you, Ari. I just showed Ari two fingers to show there are two minutes left, and then he stopped. <laughs> I like that. Two fingers. Is <laughs> <laughs> they were spread out. <laughs> Uh, Leo is the next speaker. Okay. Uh, Leo has been the, uh, the leader of uh, a big work package in the Pasita project, which was about uh, trying to see if it's possible and acceptable uh, to push for institutionalization of technology assessment uh, across Europe. Uh, and then I told you that Leo has been in uh, parliamentary GA for many years. Thank you, Lars. Yes, yeah, so I'm talking from my background in TA, <coughs> which is now quite some years that I have this background, not as much as Ari, but a little bit as well. Uh, and um, I think it's legitimate to talk from that background because I think that uh, RRI and TA have very much in common. If you look at these uh, dimensions of RRI that, that often are mentioned, like anticipation, responsiveness to uh, societal needs, inclusiveness, reflexivity, all these things are, these are all uh, aspects that we are dealing in technology assessment for a long time now. There are of course differences. I would say whereas uh, TA was meant to be and still is um, uh, uh, kind of an innovation in the realm of policy making, decision making uh, on, on a policy uh, level, RRI is now going a step further, if you want to say so, to include these reflexivity and anticipa anticipation and responsiveness into the 
research and innovation process itself. This is a specific challenge, but nevertheless, I think both DA and RRI are much about opening up the more or less private process of, uh, so far private process of, of innovation and also research, and open it up to society, make it a societal process. These are, uh, one could say, the politics that RRI and, and TA have in common, and this is really a challenge to include this in, uh, in to, or to mainstream this in uh, uh, Western innovation systems. And uh, TA has a bit of a history of this <coughs> mainstreaming process, other than RRI. Uh, that does not mean that this mainstreaming has come to an end yet. It's still a challenge, it's a constant challenge, but there's some experience. And I'll draw a little bit now on, uh, on the experience that we have <coughs> with the background, having the background in that project I last mentioned. We made an analysis in seven European countries where TA is not so established so far. Uh, in Eastern Europe, South of Europe, and Ireland. There is, I see Soya, Soya from Bulgaria, she was involved in, in, in that project as well. And um, what we, I will briefly refer to what we find out there. First thing that we did, we reflected on, okay, we are thinking about what can we do in these countries to promote mainstream technology assessment or related activities. And the first thing that you have to think of is about uh, how was the situation in the 70s and 80s when <coughs> A was in the same situation or in a comparable situation that RRI is in now, starting its career, so to say, uh, having the ambition to be mainstreamed or to, to, to change <coughs> this uh, innovation system in, in a democratic way. And what we find there in the 70s and 80s, I would say, is uh, are four things mainly. At that time, there was a strong from the, starting from the 16th, a strong governmental committee, a commitment for funding and regulating R&D, which was partly due to uh, demands from uh, the wider society to have more regulation and steering. We had a strong uh, beginning movement and strong movement in academia to shift to problem-oriented research, to orient research more into the direction of societal needs. Uh, you find that in, in you find results of that in universities nowadays, in, in pilot in sustainability research, uh, environmental impact assessment, risk assessment, all these things. That was there, was beginning to start. We had vivid, very vi vivid public debates about the pros and cons of uh, so-called technological process. Very vivid ones. Only one, only one thing to mention is uh, about uh, nuclear power plants. At that time, not only in Germany, but especially in Germany. Um, and we had uh, an expressed need, at least from parts of people from policy making, an expressed need to get more knowledge about what is going on, to say it very briefly. To be more better informed about science and technology and to be better informed about the conflicts that it causes in, in, in society. And this was, so to say, to take a term from, from Sheila Jalanov, the civic epistemologies that were there. So to say, the, the conducive environment that we had at that time <coughs> to make technology assessment successful in being institutionalized in many European countries. But if you look at the situation in these countries that we explored, but also in, nowadays in, the, in Western European countries, it's very clear that the situation is much different. There is still a governmental commitment for supporting innovation, but in a situation of, of weak innovation systems in Eastern European countries, or in under conditions of globalization and, and, and increased competition. So there is a big interest in economy first, not so much in taking care of, of, of uh, societal impacts. There is uh, problem-oriented research is widely established now in, in, in Western European countries, but it's almost not existing in some other European countries. Um, the public debate in our Western countries, I would say, dare to say it can't down at least uh, compared to the situation in the 70s and, and 80s. But this came along with institutionalization of all kinds of, uh, of uh, organizations, institutions, authorities that take care of these issues that were raised in the public debates in the 70s and 80s. We have ethic councils, we have uh, governmental authorities for risk assessment and risk management and all that. This is, this is good to have. But we have to see that this almost is not existing in some other European countries nowadays. And uh, 
Yeah, we have a demand for rational planning that, that we found especially in Eastern Europe. They, they see that the deba debate about new technologies and also policy making is going in the wrong direction. They need more planning in order to keep up with globalization and the competition that is going on there. And my point is we have to uh, adopt to these situations. We have to do something where we have to take this up. And that could mean there are some things that, that are relevant and that could support RRI, like the relevance of the user. User involvement nowadays is a, is a big issue for, for even for industry because they know that if they want to be competitive, uh, they have to be innovative and innovation uh, the innovation process will run smoother and come up with results that are accepted by society if you involve the user from, uh, from the start. Um, maybe just a last a conclusion. My conclusion is that in, as regards institutionalization or new institutions, here in, in the Western European countries, we are in a situation that there are many, many institutions that are a conducive or that form a conducive environment for RRI. And RRI has to rely on these institutions in order to be successful in being integrated in the research process itself. It's not only TA institutions, it's other institutions I mentioned like risk assessment. Very important I think is, is the, in academia the problem oriented research that is done there, science and technology studies, but also other things like risk assessment studies and so on. So there is something. But there are other countries in Europe, in the eastern parts of Europe, and the central and eastern parts of Europe, and the southern parts, where we have not this conducive environment. And I think we have to do some, if RRI wants to be successful there, something has to be done on that environment. And that would mean that we need more of these explorative studies to find out what is going on in these countries. What are the aspects where we can adopt to there in order to be successful? So for the European Commission, I think that would mean that uh, more should be done to build up this conducive environment. It's not existing in many countries. So that's, that's my last word. Thanks, Leo. Uh, thanks, Leo. Um, <coughs> we have something some, somewhere, and we, uh, and we miss something elsewhere, and but it's actually possible to do something about it. Uh, that's the uh, optimistic yeah. interpretation of what you said. Okay, uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Monica Schofield. Uh, Mona is from True Tech Innovation and she has been leading a task force on uh, responsible innovation in industry on the uh, IRMA, which is the uh, European Industrial Research Management uh, Association. And as I said, uh, Monica steps in for Hillary Sutcliffe on a very short notice. So uh, so we have talked about that Monica basically says what they did and then she will try to relate to this institutional question. Uh, so uh, please be aware that uh, Monica came in on very short notice. The preparation time was short. Yeah, it was. But anyway, thank you very much for the invitation <coughs> anyway. Um, my good colleague on the task force, Jule Kemp von Heimberg, raised the question this morning where is the innovation aspect in all this discussion because it's all been talking about research. So uh, the task force that I convened uh, in 2012 uh, was called was Addressing Responsible Innovation, never mind about the research part of it. Um, and the reason for convening this uh, task force <coughs> in the, under the auspices of the European Industrial Research Management Association the European Industrial Research Management Association can sort of think of it a little bit as a, as a club for CTOs of those industries that provide <coughs> significant amounts of industrial research in Europe. Um, and it was founded by the OECD almost exactly 50 years ago as part of the Marshall Plan. So the members of, of IRMA are companies like Siemens and ABP and, and Unilever. Uh, so these are, these are our companies doing significant amounts of, of R&D in, in Europe. And I suppose the reason why I kind of raised it to these, these members, by the way, I'm an individual member of AMR, I don't represent any particular uh, company. I have an industrial background and I'm a robotics engineer, you know, that really know where I'm coming from. Um, but I, one of the problems in the kind of policy effects, and I think we've seen it this morning, is you know, where is industry in, in, in this policy for formation? Well, 
uh, industry sort of tends to think that it's got better things to do than to sit in meetings like this, which is a little bit of an arrogant attitude that has to be said. Um, but the idea of the task force was, was actually to gather a group of people to think about it. And, and what I persuaded them is that this is, this is a term, this is coming. And the favorite sport of the commission is often regulation. And if you don't watch out, there'll be regulations related to this. Um, the members of Irma, many of them have, have contributed to things like Vision 2050. I don't know if that's uh, known to people. But if you don't know it, Google it, Vision 2050. They're very strongly engaged with sustainability agenda and now the circular economy. Um, and a lot of them are now uh, exploring the connection between the corporate social responsibilities, which are now well established, and responsible innovation, which is the emerging buzzword, if you like. Um, the companies are, are engaged in, in, in R&D for the long term. So if you, if, you, if you take a company like Siemens, that you know, topics like smart cities is, and cities of the future are, are hugely important. You know, where are we going as a human race? what will be our needs and how could these companies fulfill those needs because that's really what, what innovators uh, do. There are raising flags of concern with, with this whole um, very multidisciplinary um, field of innovation that we're now in or the playing field of innovation. Big data, um, hybrid technologies, the fusion of biochemical, nano, neuro, which are kind of scaring people uh, the blurring of boundaries, that was one of the topics that came up this morning. Concerns with the pace of innovation, uh, things getting faster, a little time to assess the impacts before you enter into significant risks, and legislation and regulation can't keep up. And if you look at fields like drones, for example, or self-driving cars, you can see some interesting areas where, where things are happening very fast. Then, uh, it's fashionable these days to, to do innovation through what's known as open innovation. In other words, you don't do it all behind the corporate walls. You're actually doing it in a highly distributed fashion with many, many different partners. And then at the end of the day, you say, well, who's in control? Um, you've got um, new uh, technologies like additive manufacturing, which en essentially enables anyone anywhere to manufacture. So you haven't got these, these, these big colossals anymore. So blurring of institutional boundaries. A democratization of innovation through developments like the app economy and 3D printing and very low cost access to powerful ICT tools. This is the, the world we're in, and industry recognizes this. Um, <coughs> industry, like what was mentioned previously, also um, feels that there is, they can, they can see the effect of a greater accountability for what they do, the public accountability, particularly in Europe. But one thing in the back of their minds that they fear, and that is there is a preoccupation with Europe becoming a less welcoming place to do innovation. And there's certainly a concern about risk aversion, societal attitudes uh, within particularly Europe, and um, polarization of societal attitudes towards certain types of innovations. But. Uh, what, what industry partly fears is having further handcuffs because not to innovate is irresponsible, actually. Uh, so we must bear that in mind. So what, what this uh, task force have been doing, we've been teasing out the issues, discussing, and we have produced a brief essentially for our members. It's called Patrick Just Guide to Responsible Innovation, for which there is a public version. If you go to the EMA website, you can uh, get part of the document. Uh, the document you can't see is the beginnings of works of sharing case studies. Um, but I suppose what the, the, the guidelines say is, is, is was summed up by, by one of our speakers, good, clean and fair are the three attributes that we would suggest um, are, are a good measure of, of responsible innovation. The topics for debate, of course, you know, is who decides what is responsible need those spaces for, for rational and real <coughs> debate, and how to handle polarization of views and changes in societal attitudes. If you take GMOs, for example, they think some people would say, we absolutely must go this way because we need to feed the planet. And there are others who say, we absolutely must not. And how do we handle that in, in peace? How to handle this topic in a global economy. Um, as I said, how to avoid simply putting more handcuffs on doing innovation 
in Europe and causing the research and innovation labs for these big companies simply, and they can be switched overnight. Um, and the role of governments in, in, in policies and procurement. <coughs> so these are the sort of things that, that we have been discussing. And I think another parameter that one needs to pack to put in, in all this is, is what to do about the, the finances. Because the companies are driven by the interests of the shareholders. Uh, and this, this is another leg that I think actually has to, has to be, be explored. I, I, refer to an article in the BBC that I read just a few weeks ago where a major investor in the UK, Neil Woodford, he's very, very well known, justifying his billion euro investments in tobacco companies. He said, I'm not really paid to be a moralist, I'm paid to give the best returns for my investors. And I think that's a dimension that we need to, to bear in mind um, considering this whole topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mar Monica. Uh, think of the environment you make for Inno. If we get them, want the Inno we need, <laughs> in the form we need it. Uh, uh, <coughs> David Vinikov, OECD, uh, Secretary of Working Party on Bio Nano and Convergent Technologies and Science and Tech Policy. Uh, so basically, what he asked you to do was to give an, an overview of the approach of our life at OECD checks. Would you do that? <laughs> Try. It's not hard because there ain't much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I joined the OECD eight months ago and from academia. So I, I'm from an STS program at UC Berkeley. So um, a I'm not really, I, I'm playing policy person, or I'm a new policy person. Um, and B, I don't know a whole lot about RRI. This, I've, I've been working on it and implementing it into some of the work I do at OECD. But I'm a bit of a novice there too. So take all this with a grain of salt. Um, I think, so let me just give you two, two seconds on what I do or where I sit. So the, the, the Workhorse of the OECD are these working parties that have delegates from all the member countries. And, the, and they're working parties for um, topical areas. And so in the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation, which recently was Science, Technology, and Industry, so that only a couple of years ago it was STI Industry, now it's Innovation, so it was interesting. Um, I'm in charge of a working party looking at these emerging technologies and explicitly looking at the kind of convergence <coughs> effects that Monica was talking about. Um, OECD as, as an institution as a whole, um, their slogan is better policies for better lives, responsible innovation, research, uh, maybe. Um, they're moving towards or trying to embrace uh, the highest levels themes like sustainability, inclusive growth. They realize they don't want to be the rich man, old, old white guys club. Um, so I would say there's an attempt to involve um, more countries. Some South American countries are coming in. India, South Africa, and China are observers. Um, within uh, STI, some of the big topics are the next production revolution, sustainable bioeconomy, open science, impact assessment, so measuring impacts of technologies and policies, and the digitalization of everything. So these are some of the cash theme themes that are occupying our director. As um, Anna, I think, pointed out earlier today, there was a meeting, high-level meeting in Daejeon, Korea for um, the STI directorate, ministers from co the countries in science and technology came and the, they basically um, tell us what to do as an organization, give us a mandate um, based on where they want cooperation to, to occur. And there were some um, phrases that had to do with the ethical and social aspects of emerging technology. Um, in my working party, in our constitutional document, there's actual language about attending to the responsible development of bio, nano, and convergent technologies. That language is fairly new, as is our working party, which used to be 
there was a biotech group and a nanotech group, and the, these groups came together and added convergent. And um, recently, in my working group, there was adopted one uh, strategy, and over our, one theme of our strategy is open and responsible innovation. So there's interest from our delegates, and I think from the organization, though I, 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 in some ways I think our group is alone in embracing the RRI explicitly in some of our projects. I think there are great opportunities for developing and institutionalizing RRI at the OECD. It's a boundary, classic boundary organization. It, it ties together policy and diplomatic and kind of knowledge-based circles. It uh, has a good reputation as a knowledge broker in STI issues. They tend to promote standards and collective action. Uh, they conduct or are interested in assessment. But I think one of the key issues is that there's a direct linkage to policymakers at the OECD, which I think is one reason it's a powerful place to institutionalize RRI. I think in general there's a willingness to learn among the secretariat and there's responsiveness to delegate interests. But I think there are some major challenges um, in thinking about whether RRI will find a fertile ground at the OECD. Um, where we just heard about open dialogue and sort of bottom-up kinds of approaches, I think OECD is a very top-down organization in general, although it's trying to be different. Um, the model of innovation in our directorate is um, linear, not collaborationist, not co-constructive, not co-productive in terms of normative and politics, uh, normative and technical together. So the general, the general um, image of innovation um, is a little bit in contrast to, I think, some of the conceptual foundations of innovation underlying RI. And in fact, science and technology um, it, at OECD and in our director is seen as a ground for um, a universalist project of innovation. And so the notion of science as a political arena um, is somewhat uh, strange and certainly um, doesn't find uh, easy ears. Um, and the idea that RI itself is fundamentally contested, that, that notion, does, wouldn't lend itself to being taken up and used in an organization, a policy organization like, like, um, like OECD. So, you know, so this gets at the issue of concretize or not concretize, um, which I want to touch on later. How many minutes do I have left? <coughs> okay, so um, I actually think there are some very promising directions for collaboration of OECD with RRI um, researchers and, and projects. I think a cross-national comparison of RRI elements um, could be a nice way to expand from Europe, a very Europe-based discourse to a more international one. And this would be finding common goals and institutions across OECD countries. Um, where are good ideas in the RRI universe being implemented and how? And compare these mechanisms and forms of instrumentalization. Mm -hmm. The navigator is a nice, um, you know, I could see navigator engaging international kinds of um, um, similar projects or to, to, to engage kind of to think about are there some universalized um, ways of thinking about it. RI themes. Um, I think uh, the issue of injecting um, RRI concerns into mainstream OECD activities. Uh, one issue is can can RRI can the measurement of, of the impacts of S and T policy. One of the big things OECD does is measure the impacts of technologies and policies in, on science and technology. Could you develop indicators around RRI to feed into that process. That would be a way of integrating um, RRI concerns directly into the assessment of S&T programs. And that would be a powerful project. Um, I think assessing the uh, impact of RRI um, policies and projects. Um, do we have indicators and the means to do that? Uh, what represents a success uh, for an RRI policy? Um, could we have that conversation and could we discuss that across countries? And then how could the concerns of RRI be brought to bear specifically on 
certain technologies and phases of research innovation. So um, science funding, IP policy, push and pull uh, policies, <coughs> investment and regulation. Can, can RI themes be translated into um, ways of modifying or engaging those policy questions? How to get there? So I think the avenue to the OECD is through policymakers, regulators, and agencies. Um, those people and or fine secretariat, um, but fine delegates on these committees, and if the delegates raise these issues, then RI will come on the agenda. That's exactly what happened in my committee. We had some European delegates who were interested in RI, and now we have a, brain, a project on neurotechnology and RI. So we're doing a, a nice big conference at Institute of Medicine on this topic of RI. Uh, one of the things we'll look at is we're going to compare across the large brain initiatives across the world, and many, and to see how they've each tried to mainstream or integrate um, responsible research innovation or ethics or LC, however you want to call it, <coughs> to compare them and to look at case studies to see how, and no one's really doing that cross-country, cross-project comparison. Concretize I agree with, but being in policy now for less than a year, it's obvious to me that um, there is a great utility in vagueness um, as well as being concrete. So um, I think RI made it into some of our documents because um, people didn't quite know what it meant, but there were some interesting ideas there. Different coalitions could activate different aspects of that, and I think that's why it succeeded as a concept at OCD. So having said that, then when you actually have to agree on what to do, then it become, can become a little bit more difficult. But I think that vagueness can help um, allow for coalitions and support. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Let's give him a hand. OK. Uh, before I open up for, for the floor, I, I have a challenge for all four of you. And you're, all of you touched upon it in a way, in, to some extent. Uh, but what I would like to, uh, I'd like to just put this to the extreme. In a way. We have a lot, in my opinion, we have a lot of irresponsible research innovation out there. Uh, it's something we, we want to be polite, so we don't say it. But if you, if you go to the uh, European uh, Environment Agency, and you download there two sets of reports on, on late uh, lessons from early warnings. There you can simply get uh, case studies of things that deliberately went wrong. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, I mean, we're talking from plastic softeners where there were alternatives in the beginning, other tracks you could be taken weren't taken. We're talking about the tobacco industry where other tracks could have been taken, they weren't. Asbestos. Other tracks could be taken, they weren't, they were actually put down uh, deliberately and so on. So there is irresponsible research innovation. <coughs> my, my question here is, if we say that this is not the starting point, but this is a milestone, as I've said, one of the milestones in a development to the future, then it's always a little nice to have an idea what this future could look like. So if we if we are a little visionary, I will be vague here, but if we can say we have the power of vagueness, I like that. Um, we have some idea, let's say 15 years into the future, where we actually installed our eyes we wanted. Some sort of institutional structure, some sort of ways we do things in society, so that we avoid late, le uh, late lessons from early mornings, kind of problems. If we backtrack from that and say, which decision should we take tomorrow in order to get there? That's basically my challenge to you. I mean, if we want to mainstream on a level so we actually get where we, where we want to get with this, which decisions is it that we, want, we, we need to have taken, or which actions? What could the DG Research do? What could a different kind of actors do with regards to decisions actually doing something about it so that we get there? Let's say in 15. 20 years, I don't know. Do you take the challenge? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Monique has ready, I think. <coughs> the presumption in a lot of the examples you have is that you know at the time that an innovation process development happens about the consequences of that. 
And I think the problems you have if you take cases like asbestos or tobacco, or I mean, when pe people started smoking, they didn't know the effects of tobacco. The problem then is how you deal with it, the situation when it starts to become aware. And obviously you have enormous powerful interests in the finance and capital markets and whatever you can. And, and, and sometimes it takes a shock like the Volkswagen situation to, to get everybody to wake up and say, well, actually, we, we do, this, this is something to factor in. But otherwise, you, you know, if you go too far down a precautionary principle, you don't take risks. And innovation means taking risks. And we, as a society, we have to be prepared to take risks. It's a balance of the risks and the benefits and how to judge it. And those, those are the ones which I do think we could, we could have more participatory uh, processes to, to, to consider. But we've got to be very careful that we don't then just become so nervous of everything that we don't do any innovation, which would be a disaster for our societies in terms of all the benefits that, 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 that we have. Now, I have, I have a view that our current economic system is probably a bit shaky and that we probably need a completely new way, you know, scrap GDP and all that sort of thing. I would support that. But, you know, one of the things you've got to bear in mind, these companies are paying your pension. Yeah? It's, it's a very, very complex, complex system. But what, what would be disastrous if we start to become too risk averse? Ari? Taking up your points about uh, the lessons of early warning, um, I'd like to come up with a suggestion which I didn't make part of my earlier presentation, that um, it also early promises, which can be very dangerous as well. Uh, already in terms of uh, uh, opportunity costs, some of, uh, early promises about health, uh, improvement uh, have that character. They just eclipse other ways of approaching uh, some of the same problems or other problems. And the, 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 I think the, the, the difficulty there is that early promises are linked with um, resource mobilization. They're within industry, in society, with policymakers, and it's almost like a game that is being played. Um, of um, strong promises for new technologies. And so then automatically, early warning becomes opposition to the promises. And so your challenge, what you should do now to actually have RRI fully integrated in another 10 or 15 years, would be to require both early warnings and early promises at an early stage, so to increase the the, the interest in anticipation, not as a point thing <coughs> that you do and then you forget about it, there's something that's part of the process. And that's already in RRI at the moment, but it doesn't, hasn't linked up yet fully with the struggle between early warnings and early promises. <coughs> and so to some extent you need to instrumentalize that a little bit. And then I would speak from my experience with constructive technology assessment, primarily with nanotechnology, or domains in nanotechnology, where I think we have actually developed methods to do that. You're not the only ones, but you can show that it can be done. And actually in the Dutch, the second Dutch Nano Technology R&D Consortium, it's now part of the training of the PhD students to actually get accustomed to those kinds of things. And there is no push at the moment to actually have them included all the time, but it's already important that people have that sort of competence a little bit of experience. <coughs> Thanks, Leo. Yeah, if I take that really serious that in, within 15 years time we should be in a situation that we have RRI applied everywhere and uh, if this would be the case, I would still be sure that we still would have face cases where we have early warnings that are not taken in account. But okay, we would have, have improved the situation a lot. That's your vision. Then I would say what is needed therefore it's 
you have to make all these principles that I have briefly mentioned in my talk, anticipatory, responsive, reflexive, and so on and so on. You have to make this part of the culture of research and innovation. That means parts of the everyday life of researchers and innovators. This is one, this is the cultural part. <coughs> the other part is you have to make this in some way mandatory. So legislation is needed here, I would say, in the last instance. Both is needed. If you want to push the culture of RRI, then you need support by policy making, by rules and regulations. And if you want to achieve rules and regulations, you need support from the innovators and, and the researchers. It goes both ways. But I would say that <coughs> to make a step in that direction, what somebody has to take the lead. And there is only there are only a few institutions in democratic societies that are legitimate to, legitimized to take this lead. So I would say there is a political decision needed. And as a first one, uh, there are a lot of things to consider here. But as a first one, I would say what you would expect is that at least for the uh, national and European research and uh, programs, funding programs, and decisions about uh, what direction should we go in with uh, with regard to emerging new technologies and, and what is needed here from the policy making side. What the first step would be to open up these kind of councils and advisory boards that are there in policy making for other actors that they have a role to play there so that it's clear, at least in these, in this realm of, of, of uh, decision making as a society, that it's clear that we have here an open transparent process about early warnings and promises we discussed it very early on and very open, and I'm pretty sure that this does not imply necessarily, at least not, that uh, we end up in a situation where we do not take any risks anymore. But we decide in a different way about what risks we are willing to take. Thanks, Leo. So I would <coughs> break things into shorter term and longer term. I think there's some clear things that could be done to prevent um, the serious campaigns of disinformation that the tobacco industry and others uh, perpetrated against the public. So I would say very strict transparency laws. I think we have to get very much more smart, much smarter about how to um, relate expertise to governance and policy making. Um, we're still searching for robust modes of public reason. Um, as Jasmoff and others have <coughs> tried to talk about it. Civic epistemology is another way of putting it. Um, I think there's a tendency to either reject the notion of expertise outright, or to say that the experts um, and the value should be separated. And I think there's probably some something in between, and we're still searching for that, that mode. Um, longer term, I think, um, this will require, I think, a political theory of s and policy, and I think it has to do with, again, um, thinking, rethinking democratic institutions with <coughs> RI and, and STS kinds of insights in mind, and that goes for everything from making research priorities and how to engage publics in that, to um, how to structure um, processes of public input into regulatory, directly into regulatory decision making, to modes of science advice. So um, rethinking the, our democratic institutions with um, pu better public reasoning um, would be the longer term project, but the shorter ones I mentioned. Thanks, Dave. And now the floor is yours. Uh, and it's not necessarily questions. Uh, basically, we're here to think together, so it's I would rather than questions actually have some uh, thoughts out there. Um, and I know I, I'm, I'm facilitating a lot of processes, and what you should never do is let four people talk and then say, are there anything out there? <laughs> so uh, I'll just give you a short uh, time to just think of Yeah. Morris Brennan from the University of Birmingham. Um, the nature of business in the 21st century is rapidly changing, so you've got companies that actually have a tendency to ignore national and international boundaries and just do what they want to do. So think of you know, Amazon, 
Yeah, could you turn your mic on? Oh, yeah. That's the one with you. Yeah. yeah. I'm just thinking about the nature of, of business, the international world of business in the 21st century, where we now seem to have companies that pretty much ignore all boundaries and pretty much ignore all companies, uh, sorry, all governments and their diktats. Uh, you know, and, and we're seeing, you know, these nearly all sort of the part of the digital economy at the moment. So I'm just wondering how are we going to encourage and engage companies like that in, in, in RRI when basically, you know, they're not bothering to pay tax, they're doing what they want for their money, they're evolving products which suit them maybe and maybe the customers. It just seems to have a quite a different take on the sort of debate that we're having here, which seems to be how, how might we institutionalize RRI in, 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 the, in the world of business. Very interesting. Can we do this without nations? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Anyone have some sort of yeah. input maybe, on that? Maybe. <laughs> or follow up <coughs> or something. Yeah. It's of course difficult to be it's of course difficult to imagine how to, to deal with that problem. On it. You have to deal with that on an international basis, but still uh, companies would be, have the opportunity to do what they want in, 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 uh, as they do in, in, in emerging uh, countries nowadays. Maybe that is more a cultural problem. I was talking about the culture of research and uh, responsible research and innovation and, and also the politics and, and the legislation. If I look at what is going on um, with regard to textile industry and the uh, situation in, in countries like Bangladesh and so on, this is disastrous, of course, what they are doing there. But on the other hand, we have a very vivid discussion, I would say a vivid discussion in our countries about making people aware of the situation. And there could be and could have hope that this public awareness of the problem and what they are doing will lead to a change in their thinking of thinking and be the change be to change in their behavior because it doesn't pay off anymore. You see this is kind of a hope you can have but yeah. Morning. Do you buy books from Amazon? I do. I don't make you guilty. I don't Yeah? Young people on Facebook are not. Yeah? It, the point is these companies, business is about value creation, and the value is in the market. And the market is you and me, if it's a consumer market, deciding on what we buy and how we buy it, and whether we take the moral considerations in whether we factor it in. If we do not do this as customers, then that's that's what's going to result. And it's very interesting the discussions we have within Irma. You know, the the B to B business-to-business -business relationships, which put actually very high value on, on sustainability and, and, and those things. And then comes the, the, the dilemma, uh, it's been put on the table for some of, the, some of the, 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 the members saying, should we stop customers from buying certain things? I mean, the choice of a particular car is the decision of the client, of the, of the customers picking certain cars. Yeah. So, so there is a there is an education process in, in, in the behaviour of consumers. If I don't care whether something is clean, fair, or good, then you can't just blame the, blame the businesses that are going to exploit it. I want to quote something actually from from Paul Pullman, who's the chief executive of the Unilever, um, and he's, he he gave this statement just ahead of Davos in 2015. And he, he points out, he said, we have a unique opportunity to be the first generation to bring an end to poverty and the last to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. It's a business as well as a moral argument. You can't have a healthy business in an unhealthy world. I believe business is part of the solution, but to make a real difference, we need to build partnerships. At Unilever, we reach two billion consumers a day, and we want to continue to serve them in years to come. Um, and he realizes that we, we, we have adopted a new kind of business model helping to live more sustainably, decoupling growth from our environmental footprint and increasing positive and social impact. Now the point is this, he can, I, I have a number of business leaders who have those kind of statements. 
But the decision is in us when you take that washing powder off the shelf. And that is something about information and, and values. Thank you. So I have to <coughs> disagree a little bit with Monica. That's a fairly limited um, view of what governance should be. Um, is it really up to me as a consumer of GAP? <coughs> can, can, could, should governance begin and end with my decision uh, in the GAP store to decide to buy a t-shirt or not? When, whether or not I do that, um, children will be hurt in Bangladesh. I think there are real roles for governance um, beyond the individual. That's a pretty radical market-based solution. I think that, however, we need to be careful about stymieing innovation. We all benefit from innovation. And um, I think if you combine the, that back to those two points with the problem of globalization and governance, um, I think one of the modes of governance we're seeing now increasing is uh, the mode towards standards, use of standards. Um, and you see, and I think there are, there are great benef potential benefits, but also pitfalls to using international standards, which are often driven by industry. Um, but I think in their best uh, cases uh, involve multiple stakeholders. So this has occurred in some of in the biofuel industry um, and many of a number of other industries where um, the decision makers and the standardization um, process has gone beyond simply the, the industry, but to engage uh, effective stakeholders. I think that's one answer. Um, if it turns out Amazon is sourcing its cardboard and cutting down trees and people get upset, there can be a push towards uh, global standards. Now standards don't always, um, aren't always binding. There are many problems with standards, but ultimately um, with transparency and the kinds of NGO networks, I think, I think standardization is one uh, mode um, to engage this problem. Wait a long time. Philippe? Yes, if I may follow up on this uh, Sorry, point. I, I pushed you out. Oh. Please, no, just put the microphone. Just push it out, okay. So I follow up on this point. Um, so I'm Philip Ray. I'm involved with the uh, Responsible um, Industry Project. I'm also coordinator of Satori, which is about ethics assessment. Um, so I think that Responsible Industry may be the first RRI project that really addresses in private industry. And historically, the RRI concept uh, has been developed mostly for the public sector, right? Uh, it's, it's for universities, it's for uh, it's a government action for government institutions. So uh, it has had some success in being institutionalized in those settings. But that's easier to do because uh, to the extent that governments support this concept, they, they have a, a certain amount of control over that public sector. And the public sector, of course, has um, uh, to some extent as an objective to, to serve society. So for private industry, it's a quite different situation. And um, there have been very few actions so far to address how RRI could be implemented, if at all, uh, uh, for the private sector. Uh, the private sector itself uh, has developed this concept of corporate social responsibility. So that's kind of the, the private sector counterpart of RRI in the public sector. And uh, I think the challenge is how to, in some way, combine the insights of RRI with those of CSR that have an almost entirely separate history. Um, oh, just more, more first. Yeah, just just very quickly to, to, to respond to that. I mean, we've been, you, 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 it should be the question that the industry is not doing anything. The fact is that one of the reasons for this, this task force is that we are sharing between com companies very, very advanced policies. It's just that that isn't part of the academic process. These are people who are dealing with the problems. So, for example, a company like Solve, a chemical company, very, very sophisticated tools now to get early stakeholder involvement to look at um, what you would call RRI. Um, they link it to their corporate social responsibilities. Company like Tuckett, completely changing the way of, 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 of business and, and its influencing what products they developed, how they manufactured their <coughs> strategies. And there are stories like this everywhere, but um, I don't think they are visible enough 
and that's one of the reasons for the, for the activities. You were from the water table. Oh, just to, uh, know, just to finish this before I give, uh, I, I began also to think of, uh, we have a TTIP negotiating going on, which where, where some of the problems put up here is that it would be more difficult to make RRI. I mean, basically these kind of, 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 uh, of commerce deals could, they could, could just as well do the opposite. Strengthen the idea of the responsible action and research and innovation. So. I mean, there are tools we have, we already use, but maybe they, they could potentially be used in one direction, but sometimes they're used in the other direction. Uh, and I think that's worth thinking of. And then. I just want to, yeah, I, have it. I just want to uh, inject um, a different perspective in the discussion, helping maybe academia and industry find a common ground for discussion because I think part of the issue we are dealing with is these are different words at the moment I talk. The industry talks about indus within industry, the academia talks about in, in, uh, amongst an idea here, and the policy makers get two messages and then they make up their mind and do something that could be good or could be not so good depending on what they make out of what they get. I think what we are seeing here are three trends which uh, uh, provide a unique opportunity to make a major change in the way these things happen. One is the empowerment of the individual via information, that's the internet, and via purchasing power, which is basically the increased wealth in the world. How many more people have now opportunity to buy stuff they don't need just to survive? Think about China, think about India. So that's one trend. And that transcendence nations as well. That's one of the issues of the nation states. Mm -hmm. The other part is um, uh, companies obviously want to leverage these exist e e emerging opportunities because if they scale wonderfully and that's why the, particularly the internet company makes so much money right now but other companies will follow so it's, it's a trend all companies have to follow to stay competitive and, 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 and survive basically. So they have to deal with that in one way or the other. But there's an interesting mechanism going on or antagonism going on. On the one hand, the empowerment of the individual. On the other hand, the empowerment of the reach of companies. And then the nation state sitting there and doesn't know what to do about it, which is a little bit my feeling, creates a, an impact of the individual on the company, which is unheard of. Because the companies are only one thing afraid of, which is their stuff is not bored. Think about Brent Spar. That's a couple of years ago, but Shell, caved in very, very quickly when suddenly in a different country, I think it was mostly Germany but also the Netherlands, suddenly people stopped taking shell petrol because of an issue which has nothing to do with actually buying petrol but a lot to do with how the company operated or was perceived to operate. So that's what they are very afraid of in the view of the big investment in these structures and the big stakes at, at the big money at stake. They will be very careful about managing innovation which creates opportunities but on the other one has risks. And responsible innovation, I think from an industry point of view, has the unique opportunity to rationalize and make this process transparent for all sides. And then industry will profit, the individual will profit, and if the nation state is flexible and doesn't think about nation state in the old sense, but nation state in a, maybe in a different, in an extended sense, then the, the, the government will also profit from it. Standards is that they are, they take a long time and they're absolutely full of compromises. It's not the best, most, and this is this is going to be the discussion of, of, of the fear of the the current tip um, discussions, which is why and, and the problem when you introduce standards and I and I, I you know I've done it previously with business ethics and the North American way of dealing with business ethics and the European the Europe, UK way of dealing with business ethics. And in, in the North American context, but in the US, it's, it's, a policy, it, it's about compliance to the rules. So you get lawyers involved, as opposed to, to 
certainly in the UK, where, where the policy is to try to get values, to incorporate values. And I, my fear is when you start to talk about regulation and all this sort of thing, it, it then becomes an issue for lawyers. And actually, what we need is corporations, and we need good citizenship of everybody in companies and as consumers, and it comes back to this, this, the societal value thing. It's just a reflection of whether you can believe in standards being the solution. It takes a long time. And, and, and if you take government regulation, the trouble is if government regulation comes in too soon, like, for example, biofuels and the European Commission insisting that certain biofuels are put in, in cars, um, and without reflecting on the effects early on about the food chain, um, you, you get the wrong standards and they become difficult to change. Yep. And just to lean in between some of them, use their microphones. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Angela Simone and Bassetti Foundation. Uh, just a question uh, on to Monica Schofield uh, and to add something uh, more about risk. You said that uh, innovation means uh, taking a risk, but I think that the relevant point, uh, what is at stake, it is uh, what kind of risk and decided by whom? Uh, decided by a panel of experts, scientific and ethical experts, like uh, we have seen, for example, for genome editing uh, next December in Washington, uh, last December in, uh, in Washington, or decided by the public, the consumers. I think this is the, the relevant question about risk. Thanks very much. Well, we have the, the session is coming to an end. Um, I think it has been interesting to see that we, in a way, uh, when when I prepared this, uh, we prepared this session, I think we had this idea of a, a huge question. I mean, a, a very huge question, going into all different parts of society. And I think our discussion has really, uh, I mean, uh, proved that it is. But on the other hand, I also think we got some ideas which you can look at in an optimistic way. I mean, we, 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 we can see some places in the market regulation where something could be done if we want to. Uh, we can see something in making institutions which could embed this and stand for this and develop methodologies and we, and they, and, and we can stand on the shoulders of developments that are more than 20 uh, years old and, and actually have a praxis. Uh, we can see that there are systems, we talked about standards, it's not, it's not that they are super systems, but they are systems that can do something and I mean all systems have problems and uh, opportunities in them. But we can see uh, systems where there are opportunities for embedding this. Uh, we talked for example about standards, also about international uh, rule settings uh, for markets and things like that. I think we, we can see some developments in the future. And the interesting thing for me is now is the basic the question that Ari put up, is there a political momentum behind this? So I mean, if we sit here and we can see that something could be done uh, to implement this and mainstream this idea of responsible research innovation, then basically the next phase is about policy making. I think that would be my last words, and then you can swallow it with the lunch. Uh, because there is a lunch break now, and I guess it's a buffet out there in the big hall. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here and contributing and listening. Uh, it's been nice to be with you.